My name is Kira Ennis. I'm the director of Pitts College Art Galleries. I'm delighted to welcome you to Pitts College today. It's wonderful to see so many friends today from Pitts and also from Los Angeles. So thank you so much for making the effort to be here today. So before we introduce our remarkable speaker, Lauren Bonn, sitting over there, I would like to extend my thanks to those who've made this event possible. To begin with, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to Murray Pepper and Vicki Reynolds Pepper for funding this lecture series, <laughs> which has allowed us to bring extraordinary speakers like Lauren Bond to our campus. Their generosity and dedication to supporting artists of this caliber has had a dramatic impact on our program, and we are extremely grateful. So thank you again. This lecture is taking place in conjunction with the exhibition Lauren Bond, Bending the River, which was jointly curated by Fulcrum Arts and Pitts College Art Galleries, and was part of Fulcrum Arts' expansive Deep Ocean, Deep Space Festival. I would therefore like to thank Fulcrum's curator and writer, Patrick Reed, and Pitts College Art Galleries, exhibition and communications manager, Chris Michno, for their significant contributions. I'd also like to single out my dear friend, Robert Crouch, executive and artistic director of Fulcrum Arts for his immense contributions to this curatorial collaboration. I'd also like to highlight members of the Metabolic Studio who worked tirelessly on this show and participated in the academic programming over the semester. Richard Nielsen, Andrea Martinez, Ashley Fove, Dorena Holland, Roxanne Steinberg, Jen Curtis, Tristan Duke, Emily Lacey, Antoine Medon, Millie Modern Moore, Douglas Lee, Michelle Braid, Olan Jones, John Yee, David Bain, Aaron Ebensberger, Jamie Oliver, Caroline Exigur, and Harold Martin. However, I wanted to reserve my very special heartfelt thanks to Lauren for giving so generously of her time and for her willingness to connect her show throughout the semester to a range of classes, including Decolonial Queers, Art in the Age of Protest, Health and the Environment, Lies and the History of Statistics, and Art, Innovation, and Exhibition. Lauren's interaction has been incredibly valuable to our students and to us as connecting the gallery's work to the academic program is central to our mission. So thank you, Lauren. And finally, just one more thing. Um, Lauren will be giving a walkthrough of her exhibition directly after this lecture at 5.30 in the Lensner Gallery, which is in Atherton. It's just literally a three minute walk across campus. So we'll all be heading over there. So uh, please come and join us. Um, and now to our distinguished speaker, Lauren Bond, whom Robert Crouch will introduce. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Kira, thank you for inviting me to introduce Lauren. And most of all, thanks to Lauren and her team for putting together an incredible exhibition and academic program. Um, I've been an admirer of Lauren's work for a long time, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that here. I won't spend too much time, but I also want to say I've had the honor of introducing Lauren a few times. So if you uh, have heard me speak about her work before, I'm going to try a slightly different tactic this time. So we'll see if it's as entertaining as it has been in the past. <laughs> Um, you know, so I run this organization called Fulcrum Arts, and our mission is to champion creative and critical thinkers at the intersection of art and science to provoke positive social change and contribute to a more vibrant and inclusive community. So for those of you who already are familiar with Lauren's work in the Metabolic Studio, obviously that's a really great fit. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what we do and why Lauren's work is so tremendous um, within Fulcrum's uh, program and why we really value what she's doing for the city. You know, as an organization that does the majority of our programming in public spaces, um, we try to think of our work as operating on a civic scale as opposed to just being public art. But what do we mean by civic scale? 
Uh, we think of work that addresses and engages specific communities from a small group of people, maybe a park or a neighborhood to an entire city. Um, but we think not just in terms of scale, but investment and impact and asks our, ask ourselves, how are we engaging in creative problem solving as citizens? I'm going to go out on a limb with an unpopular opinion or provocation uh, about po politically and socially engaged art and ask yourselves, what is the impact beyond an exhibition or event? What is gained when an artist appropriates political ideologies or the problematics of socioeconomic disparities for the purposes of creating an art object, exhibition, or performance? Sometimes the, the word awareness is used to bring attention to a particular problem, uh, but given the relatively small audiences for the arts in this country, an art project might not be the most effective medium for communicating a problem to the public. Just something I want to kind of put out there as a preface to Lauren's work. You know, one of the first projects I became aware of um, with uh, Lauren and the Metabolic Studios was when she was undertaking the seemingly Sisyphusian task of delivering truck road, truckloads of rainwater to collect it in Los Angeles to the Owens Valley. I have since um, followed her work. That was the first provocation that made me think, okay, this is not just an artist's studio, but there's something else at play. Probably a little bit crazy. So I got to figure out who this Lauren Bond person is. <laughs> you know, I'd since followed her work. She's done work with the Veterans Hospital. She did work, did an amazing installation at LACMA. Um, but that piece of work that she did with the water really stuck with me because it seemed like she was trying to balance a creative expression or an artistic intervention with actual impact. What is actually going to make change you know, to a community, whether it's big or small, local or remote? Like That seemed to be the question. And I think one of the things I find so compelling about Lauren's work is that she does a fantastic job of balancing those creative expressions with actual impact. Um, I spent more time getting to know Lauren. The Water Wheel Project, which she'll talk about, um, became incredibly fascinating for me to learn about. And then, you know, by the time she started digging up space at the moon, which she'll talk about later, I was just completely enamored by what she was attempting to do. And it brought me back to that question of what does it mean to engage uh, with using art on a civic scale. And I think Lauren is a fantastic example of a tradition of art making that very few artists are able to accomplish to have gen genuinely meaningful and long-term impact beyond a studio practice. So now I'll just get into her bio really quickly. Uh, Lauren Vaughn is an environmental artist from Los Angeles, California. Her practice, the Metabolic Studio, explores self-sustaining and self-diversifying systems of exchange that, fee that feed emergent properties that regenerate the life web. Some of her works include Not a Cornfield, which transformed and revived an industrial brownfield in downtown Los Angeles into a 32-acre cornfield for one agricultural cycle. 100 Mules Walking the Los Angeles Aqueduct in 2013, a 240 mile performative action that aimed to reconnect the city of Los Angeles with the source of its water for the centenary of the opening of the Los Angeles Aqueduct. Her studio's current work, Bending the River, aims to utilize Los Angeles' first private water right to deliver 106 acre feet of water annually from the LA River to over 50 acres of land in the historic core of downtown LA. This model be, can be replicated to regenerate the 52-mile LA River, reconnect it to its floodplain, and form a citizen's utility. So everybody, please join me in welcoming Lauren Bond. Thank you. You're very welcome. Can we dim those lights just slightly? Is that possible? Will it ruin the video? Perfect. So, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, coming out to Claremont College's Pittsburgh Gallery. Thank you 
everybody for putting this exhibition together. Thank you, Metabolic Studio, uh, for all the work you did in putting this exhibition together. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the Tongla and Gabrielino, um, whose home, uh, ancestral home we're on today, um, and to talk about, um, you know, this whole idea of water and bending the river in Jungian analysis is very connected to the unconscious. And the metabolic cycle of work is largely about trying to enact and embody um, a reconnection to the primary land that we're on, especially as um, many of us come from, we're in a diasporic condition when we find ourselves here. And so to bend a river not only involves the actual um, experience of taking a flood control measure we call a river, which does have water in it, um, but it, it has allowed me to unearth um, the um, hidden uh, water that's buried beneath the city, beneath the concrete, beneath the tarmac. Uh, so when we talk about bending the river and reconnecting it, it is largely a metaphor for consciousness and thinking about how, um, how um, embodied actions often deliver us towards consciousness. So I wanted to start uh, this talk today with a uh, deep appreciation uh, for the Tongva and Gabrielino, whose land we also at Metabolic Studio work on and with, um, and to talk about the um, Paiute, whose land um, this picture is um, taken on. So this is a picture when a Metabolic Studio decided to begin bending the river. We decided to um, really put our bodies in space to understand the 240 miles of siphons, channels um, um, uh, that connect the snow melt from the Eastern Sierra to the Cascades in Silmar so that when we talked about the LA River, we actually give it a source, because very often when we talk about the LA River, it's like immaculate conception. <laughs> it's like, it, like it, it has 51 miles, but it's not got a source and it has no delta. It has just a bunch of <laughs> uh, banks of concrete. So we decided let, let's, let's actually find out um, about all of these places. That, that, that make up the LA River and all of the communities that it runs through and um, all of the jurisdictions that we needed to get uh, permits to move 100 mules across the street in were a way of telling a story. So here I am sitting by the river. Yes, the river is inside that steel tube, watching it pass by lifted from its natural borders and edges. This river, river travels through steel veins and under concrete. Here I sit, eyes turned toward the unknowable, like eyes on ships staring out at the unknown. Water and rivers have often represented the unconscious and our glance out at that horizon is an ancient symbol guiding us forward. <laughs> we have followed the buffalo. Bison traces were characteristically north and south but several key east-west trails were used later as railways. Their season migration between feeding grounds, countless hoofs hammered prairies, seeding wild grasses and pounding watersheds with their heft, each a thousand pounds, avoiding mud in summer and snowdrifts in winter. They made paths followed by the indigenous and later colonizers. And as the 20th century painter Thomas Hart Benson once said about these sagacious pathmakers, 
the bison paved the way for the railroads to the Pacific. This is the world that the bison migrated on. This photogram is the continent stripped bare. It's a projection of the North American continent with all the cities, states, country borders removed, leaving only the rivers and the streams that the American bison would have freely moved through. So this cycle of work that I call the metabolic cycle began 21 years ago. Um, just after 9-11, I had recently moved back to Los Angeles from London. And when the World Trade Center towers were attacked, it occurred to me that the world might radically change, that everything that we had, that I had thought was secure became open again for consideration. I realized I didn't know really who my neighbors were. I didn't know where my food came from. I didn't know where my water came from. I somehow magically thought that my ATM card was going to provide me with all of my daily needs. And I thought to myself, I maybe need to rethink this strategy. So I went to Catalina Island, always a good opportunity to get away, uh, with my two tiny children, bringing everything I needed for a wonderful week of camping. Marshmallows and books and toys and stories. We nestled into our uh, tents, and when I woke up in the morning, I heard some strange sounds outside, and I came out of the tent, and there was a whole herd of giant bison. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> I went back in the tent, and I zipped it. <laughs> Maybe they'll go away. <laughs> um, turns out that they were brought over for the filming of Zane Gray's 1924 feature film, The Vanishing Americans. They were brought from North Dakota to Catalina Island. And then their scenes were cut out of the film, but they were left on the island. <laughs> um, so they were left there, and they quickly bred way out of what the island's habitat could support. With no natural predators, they reproduced and overpopulated the island and were being killed to control the population. And like a divine messenger, they appeared to me. Something needs to be done. I knew I had to return to the heartland, and they had to return to the heartland of this continent where they came from, to the people of the seven council fires and I was able to help. This holy soul has a very important relationship in the mindset of her people. And she had been in my dream. I saw a bison airlifted off the island and put on trains, trains that were built on these ancient pathways that were actually forged by the buffalo's range. And these buffaloes wanted to go back on those trains back on their own range, back home. So together with many different uh, native organizations, we were able to organize the first repatriatization of an animal uh, on the North American continent. The bison return um, was met with an act of reciprocation I only came to understand later. Grandpa Roy, a healer from the Lakota Sioux Nation, sent me seeds in another vision and how to plant them. Uh, this began a whole series of reparation work, which involves an entirely new mapping system. To begin, we lay down some new axes, new connections, and a new direction to guide the axial projections that are independent and re reconnect disconnected places. This projection uh, has recently been done by Jack Rendler, who started to work at the studio after the show began. <laughs> um, and here he's used the um, heart chakra over the Great Basin, over the continent, to kind of, in a way, model for us this independent uh, layer of lines that uh, can be guiding lines, es esoteric body lines. 
uh, that reconnect with the heart, the heart of the continent. And for me, that is often embodied in the heart of ranging wild animals like the great American bison. So the seeds came back from Grandpa Roy Stone and in ceremony and in the light of the return of the buffalo, uh, we, we, um, in one of the seven sacred rites, he sent me a vision of the corn and corn like the buffalo are sacred to the Plains First Nation people. A fast was made, a fire was built, tobacco offerings and the burning of medicine was shared during an all night ceremony in two places reconnected for that night by the Buffalo Range. Corn harvesting people who have the gift of the corn mother, the making of relatives, the conjoining of foreign and hostile people becoming one people and the corn represents that. Seed on mounds represent the souls that are planted with corn. It's a matrilineal landscape. The dialectic of opposites, the blessing of gold, fire symbolized the covenant. And this is what magically happened. Um, from that night, what had been a derelict train yard, which I've only recently learned was the terminus for the bison range. So the bison would range to what would have been the floodplain of the unbridled river. So the, bi the train tracks that came across the continent ended up against the mountains we now call Elysian Hill where, and, and, and Solano Canyon. They didn't go up there, they stayed in the floodplain and that was the terminus point for the buffalo's movement. I only recently learned that, but that's why Grandpa Roy had sent me the vision to plant the seeds on this derelict cornfield. And the chlorophyll revolution began. 32 acres of oily train yard that had been unused for 75 years became this amazing emerald green place. And at that point, um, the uh, California state park system had recently won that property as a um, detente from two different developers that had wanted it. So Chinatown had wanted it and Dogtown, where we have a lot of the industrial buildings, had wanted it. And the judge had decided nobody gets it. The people of the state of California get it. We're going to make the first urban park here. The, so the California state park system, which is the largest state park system in the United States, got their first property, but their intention was to land bank it, meaning do nothing. So when I went in and said, I would really like to clean up this site, I'd like to make a reparation with it, and I'd like to do it with corn, they said, fine, but there was no historic proof that anything like corn ever grew there. And I said, fine, let's call it not a cornfield, just to make sure that, <laughs> just to make sure that anybody who might have thought that there was a cornfield historically will now be uh, dispossessed of that illusion. Um, so that's how the name not a cornfield occurred. It was a um, bureaucratic conversation about history. Um, <laughs> Um, but to make that to make that happen, um, we ran 90 miles of irrigation stripping on that abandoned tow yard. Um, being a driver from LA, I had to measure things in car miles. So I figured that's an hour and a half drive that you would always see uh, <laughs> irrigation stripping somewhere. That's how much irrigation stripping we had to lay on property that would have been naturally flooded every time it rains. So in order to save uh, money, uh, I got into one of Robert's favorite images of me, which is a water truck, went down to the LA River, filled up the water truck with water in the LA River while people were making guerrilla films um, and rock videos, and would take the water back to the cornfield and connect it to the 90 miles of irrigation stripping. And I did that for long enough that people just thought it was normal 
until the corn started to grow and people started to realize where the water was coming from. And they rushed over to say, cease and desist, that's against the law. So <laughs> um, I realized that there was a lot more work to do <laughs> at that point. What you see on the left was the way the cornfield looked when we took, uh, we took it on to clean it up. So, um, so the process of converting this 32-acre brownfield into a cornfield began with removing truckloads of toxic soil, rocks and debris, bringing in soil from other construction sites, adding irrigation stripping, and planting corn sourced from the dry bed farmers in the arid west. But what we weren't able to do at that time was to dig below that impacted soil to the rich mana of the floodplain, the um, primary forest of the arid west, which is just waiting to be unearthed underneath this city. Um, so it's still to be discovered that a new discipline wants to emerge that defines the interior architecture of a place as the interior of the continent rather than the interior of the building. And the art of architecture becomes the creation of novel urban ecosystems and the undevelopment of outmoded structures and infrastructures unless they support the web of life. And that took us, the, the, the being told that you can't take wastewater out of the LA River, which has already been used, took me up to the source of that water in the Eastern Sierra. And what you're seeing when you look down here is the desiccation of Owens Lake. Now, Owens Lake is one of a network of glacial lakes that stretch all the way from ancient Lake Lahontan to Lake Bonneville. These are the native names for Salt Lake and Mono Lake, right? So that entire that entire uh, space would have been in, at first an inland sea, but later a series of cascading basins uh, where water would move from one into the next. And it would have been the home of thousands of migrating birds and animals like the grizzly bear and um, um, wildcats and deer. Um, and we know that the first um, incipient, incipient agriculture, the basics of agriculture, happened here in the Paiute areas where they learned how to alternate their fields from the snowmelt and grow grains. Um, so people were coming to this valley from all over the world to study the history of um, agriculture. So artists need to create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. It's become overwhelmingly evident and critical that we halt the continuous release of millions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. It is also critical that we stop interfering with and support the regenerative flow of rainwater into our aquifers as the notion of an ever-depleting, life-sustaining water supply is becoming reality. How do we work with the city as a built form? How do we think on this industrial and urban scale? Bending the river creates the first adaptive reuse of the Los Angeles infrastructure since concrete was poured on top of the floodplain of the unbridled river in the 1930s. Community ownership of power is the most promising path toward equity, democracy, and renewable energy. Put people in the driver's seat and begin to repair present harms constituted by past harms to both human and other than human beings. The Los Angeles River is covered with water-resistant, impervious concrete, which interferes with the ocean, sky, earth, aquifer cycle. And since the aquifers can't be replenished when it rains, they also cannot do the natural cleansing 
depolluting and filtering action of the earth as the water drains through it. But if we uncover the city, if we allow the floodplain to recharge, we can sequester carbon and release oxygen for us to breathe. Under our roads, under our paved surfaces, lie buried rocks, soil, mulch, seed, duff, dander, feather, bone, all of the living beings that have lived and formed the earth around us. This is to our ecozone what the old growth forest is in others. So here we are three years ago, lifting the first piece of concrete, 5,000 pounds, that's five buffalo, <laughs> five buffalo in one triangle, off the floodplain of the LA River. Um, just to give you a little uh, excitement, even the construction workers who were working with us that day um, got excited about this. And I thought how interesting that it comes back to the original dream of airlifting the bison off the island. This uh, lifting of this gigantic burden from the floodplain so that it could re reconnect uh, the sky to the ground. It's so powerful. And the delta symbol, the triangle, uh, was what I decided to cut the, the cut plan for the, um, the concrete, um, partly because of the delta being the way water should spread, um, and partly to make an aesthetic object out of something that is also an invisible thing. Like it had never occurred to me that the, the basement level of the city, the floor of concrete, was also the ceiling of the pre-colonized world, right? So everything, I'd always thought of the bottom of the city being the top of the concrete, but when you lift the concrete up, you realize when you look down, there's a whole other river underneath the concrete, and it's flowing on top of that 2.3 billion year old uh, soil. Behold the rock, sand, wood, seed, feathers, duff, dander, bone, clay, which we just call debris. Ordinarily, this would all just go to the dump. All of this ma material, which would be washed in floods, was then buried under concrete for a 100 years. This is the stuff of breath the cloud, soil, aquifer, seed, cloud exchange happens here. Begin with this recognition and form a consensus, or at least a plurality, to value anti-colonial, anti-capitalist soil repair. Not a cornfield was called not a cornfield uh, because I was told no corn grew there on the unbridled river. But that doesn't include spoken word narratives. That only includes written word narratives. There's a whole other history of place that has to do with spoken word narratives. Unbuild the city. Reconnect the soil and the air, the clouds and the aquifer. Allow for life-giving union of seed and fungi, a multi-species union to create the mesh, the undernet, the neural networks from which the self-propagating, self-diversifying life web can propagate from. Always good to show what we call destruction on the left. Um, and perhaps we should reconsider um, as we think about climate uh, uh, change and climate refugees, and certainly one of the things we're hearing is that the atmospheric rivers that are going to be coming through are going to reconnect to this kind of flood situation because the scale of the LA River, imagine this for all of you architect types out there, the scale of the LA River 
was designed by people who were considering what the worst storm in 100 years could look like, right? So it's, it's, that's a basic rule of thumb for engineers. It's like designed for the worst storm in 100 years. Well, now what engineers are saying is that storm is going to be every year, right? The storms that are coming are going to reconnect uh, this. So what I'm telling, uh, what I'm suggesting that we do is unpave as much of the city as we can so when this happens, the water has somewhere to go. Because otherwise, it's just going to sit on top of the ground and then what? So again, this, this way of drawing lines in space, whether it's a, a drawing with 100 mules walking 200 from full moon to full moon, or a drawing of, of a new axial um, way of thinking about a decolonized continent, um, this is largely uh, the practice of per performative action. Are these lines, are these rays that Metabolic Studio have taken through space and time together? And one of those takes us to the seven generation rule. A lot of native teaching says don't make any decisions that won't hold for seven generations. Well, if you do the simple math on that, uh, and call a generation 20 years, because it's a nice even number. Um, seven generations times 20 is 140 years, which takes us to 1880, which is the opening of the train yard where not a cornfield was, right? So if we think about the entire colonized history of Los Angeles, it's a seven generation situation that we're at a turning point to consider. So when we talk about future systems and we think about a new seven generation rule, we need to think what systems do we want to have in place for 140 years from now? What is the right thing to be doing? So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is silver. So the rationale for the trains was silver. So silver that was found in the same mountain that we import water from, which is the Sierra, created the new hope uh, for manifest destiny, right? So manifest destiny being the ideology of the colonizers was that if you were going to compete with um, monarchs in Europe, you better have a plan. And the plan was built on international, controlling international trade. Um, so the idea of Manifest Destiny was to find a route through the entire continent. So first George Washington made a fortune by bringing over the mules from Europe in order to build the Erie Canal. Um, and then the mules were brought out west when they discovered silver because they'd overbuilt the railway in order to support the gold rush. Um, so when the silver mining happened, the railway in Los Angeles was established as a way to bring silver from the Eastern Sierra back to the East Coast. Um, it was brought to places like Rochester, where it was made into Kodak film, um, and then brought from Rochester back to the Sierra, where they were making Westerns, right? And to places like Catalina, where they were making Zane Grey films. But this material, this silver, was the, um, the thing that re-terraformed the continent. What is our silver today? Well, it's most likely lithium. And lithium is currently been discovered as lying under the Salton Sea. So the largest uh, uh, holding of lithium on the planet right now is under the Salton Sea. And there's a new drive to pull all of that lithium out, and apparently there's enough to get the entire United States on lithium power um, and still export some. So that's another interesting story, which will take us, <laughs> um, take us to the Colorado River. Um, but to come back to the show that you're going to see, um, because I've tried to put this talk together to augment what you'll see in the gallery. 
Um, but I wanted to read you, um, you know, how much empirical work the studio has done to really try and understand, well, when we talk about the water in the river, we often talk about it as a liability and talk about how dangerous it is or how bad it is. Or like when I was told to cease and desist connecting the wastewater river to the cornfield, it was because the LADWP didn't want liability for somebody getting sick on the park. It wasn't, that was the reason. It was lit litigation fear. Um, so here's a, a, a something that Lee Adams, who's here today, um, uh, was part of. She, uh, they said a lot to process, but Lee and I noticed extremely, I think James may have also written this, extremely high levels of aluminum in the riverbed and dewatering tanks, soil samples. Uh, good and bad news, a lot of impaction in the riverbed, but it seems like purple beans are the answer to phytoremediating aluminum. <laughs> so I wanted to just give you the kind of things that Metabolic Studio does, right? There is no, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So this this is what you'll see in the gallery. This is the LA River, right? This this is the uh, what the LA River actually looks like, and it ought to really be celebrated. I am going to um, talk a little bit about um, um, finding space here in the corn in of the moon uh, or undevelopment one. Um, so when, when we brought the floodplain from underneath the river, uh, when we started in construction and we lifted that triangle off and we saw the floodplain underneath the river, the very first occupant of that floodplain was a coyote who immediately knew somehow that of all of its range, this was the right place to be. And my mentor, uh, Newton Harrison, who passed away a few months ago, uh, wrote me this note when he saw this coyote there. He said, when I visited your studio last and saw the coyote haven and other havens, and came, I came to the conclusion that these little islands were clear manifestations that life is abundant and would take advantage of any opportunities offered to self-complicate and to become in its own terms abundant. Although not so named, a number of people understand this. What they don't understand is that the life web has another thing it does automatically. It networks and self-complicates as much as it can with the energies available. So I was questioning what might be gained from your inventing perhaps, unknown to yourself, four or five little havens like this. Maybe the owl is next. If some small voles come and small mice come, so will the ring-tailed hawk. Looking over the fence at the desolate path along the train, I suddenly envisioned the planting of edible understory the same way an overstory with fruits and nuts, etc. The idea being that you can invent a system that self-complicates. Part of the complication will be other species that come and live with it. You have a long, narrow band and you're now working with. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So this is the un undevelopment one. Uh, so we took a tow yard just across from Metabolic Studio and cut out six study circles um, and um, this is a rendering that we did showing if you just cut small piercings into the LA River and removed the floodplain underneath it, you could create this self-complicating system throughout the industrial corridor and it would uh, give back a carbon garden all of its own, on its own accord. And if all the gutters that feed the Los Angeles River are considered tributaries of an urban watershed, that are able to feed the aquifers that have been paved over by concrete and roads, then redirecting a small portion of the low flow channel of the Los Angeles River to unpaved land adjacent to it, it not only enlivens the soil but recharges the aquifers. And all of us who use the water 
that moves from our homes into the river are part of a new utility. A new kind of urban utility wants to emerge, a citizen's utility. Um, so what I've learned from cleaning an industrial yard, ask permission of indigenous community to be their guest, lay irrigation stripping, do ceremony with community, plant drought resistant native corn or other native remediating plants, haul in quote dirt from other construction sites nearby, seek equine labor wherever possible and collect manure, harvest rainwater from roofs from buildings around the brownfield. Use solar power. Build trust by being trustworthy. What I've learned cleaning lead impacted soil, case study one, one acre site formerly owned by Chevron Gas Company. Collect rainwater, store it in large tanks, dig clay out of the ground, sieve through it to make it easier to use, fire oyas once, not twice, bury the oyas, fill with water, plant native plants, compost plants, grow gourds, and harvest to carry water. What I've learned on how to make a carbon garden on an industrial lot, case study. The historic floodplain is our old growth forest in Southern California. After a century of neglect, the abandoned train yard in the historic core of Los Angeles has regained its momentum. Cycles of growth and decay, life and death are again at play. We are building topsoil, harvesting water, flat topped warehouse roofs in our industrial neighborhood, collect water to grow food and medicine. We have uh, 51 miles of concrete channel uh, in the geographic floodplain of the unbridled river uh, to now focus on. And um, and essential elements of the metabolic studio practice. Community ownership or power is the most promising path toward equity. Reconnect the cloud soil aquifer cycle, unbuild the city wherever possible, know where your food and water come from, read books that inspire, reparation work involves rebuilding the world, it will take time, be kind to yourself. Metabolic studio, um, to build a research-based art practice from ennobling problems. Our projects would advocate for the commons of the world's oceans, topsoil, atmosphere, and forests. And although the life web makes abundance, this does not negate the entropy that takes place under the practice of capitalism. The net loss has reached an extreme peak, and in the laws of physics, when a force emerges, a counterforce comes to meet it. We are the force that emerged and the dying back of the life web is the counterforce that meets it. Newton called the force that meets us the trial by fire, which is a series of shocks sent out by the life web. In his words, the life's web, life web's big message is a 100 degree temperature at the North Pole and its little message is the coronavirus and fertility rates decreasing. And although Newton understood the earth to be expelling us, he believed there was hope. As the life web expels us, quote, a new teacher has emerged, and the new teacher that has emerged is called the trial by fire. The trial by fire is our teacher. We have invented a trial by fire, and now we have to cope. And I think as the fire gets worse, coping mechanisms will be part of ev the everyday subject matter. And as that happens, I think at least some part of the population's empathy will grow. I do believe that empathy is the key here. For Newton, empathy is hardwired to us genetically, is survival-based, and our contemporary culture has dismantled it and has made it almost impossible to happen. Newton saw empathy as an integral part of that which governs the greater flow of life. But just as the laws of thermodynamics have been ignored by capitalism, the culture of capitalism leaves no room for empathy. 
This is precisely because capitalism is invested in non-life. It is non-life, and empathy is a vital life force. Newton believes that if empathy evokes you hard enough, it evokes a kind of opening of your hands so that you give everything you got, everything that you have in you to help or engage or do. Empathy is about the only thing that does that. It belongs to a specialized subset of what one would call love. So to build a research-based art practice from ennobling projects, our projects advocate for the commons. And I'm hoping that uh, tonight uh, you will see some of that in the uh, show. Um, and I just wanted to end by talking a little bit again to bust out of the civic bubble into this new kind of constellation about what we're a part of. Uh, there's some 250,000 square miles of dams, siphons, pipes, and power plants that redirect and harness the flow, harness the flow of the snowpack of two mountain ranges, the Sierra and the Rockies. Nearly 50 million people today are uh, in a couple of dozen urban centers. Los Angeles takes the lion's share of the water and power. We are all surviving on this cyborgian watershed. The mighty Colorado River supplies drinking water for 40 million people and irrigates 5 million acres of farmland. What happens when it dries up? The dams power nearly a million homes. The Imperial Valley has 460,000 acres of farmland, making $2 billion worth of food. Next to the Imperial Valley, in fact, uh, is the Salton Sea, formed by a breach in the water supply to the Salton Sea, where today, as I mentioned, 32 million metric tons of lithium has been found. New ways of thinking about shared resources a commons, create an exodus diagram that Jack has projected for us, an exodus of dense urban places and a reconsideration of our interdependence. We, um, we have laid 51 miles of concrete channel onto a geographic floodplain of the unbridled river to prevent the vital floodwaters from wrecking havoc. Burrows make up most of the wild equine population along the Colorado River, but there are plenty of wild horses too. And back to this empathy thing, these animals use their hooves to dig more than six feet deep to reach groundwater for themselves, in turn creating oases that serve as a boon for wildlife, American badgers, black bears, an array of birds, including some declining species such as the elf, uh, shelf elf owl. In the Pleistocene, there were more than 10,000 uh, years ago, there was a handful of equine species that lived in North America, including small horse-like animals and camels, but later went extinct. So while the colonizers like George Washington brought equines to the USA to help build the infrastructure, they, these animals were here before and today provide a tremendous service. The geochemistry or the chemistry of the earth is critical for terrestrial architecture. Our megastructures and megalopolises need to be reconsidered as highly interwoven with our terrestrial systems. The biosphere has a method of handling homeostasis or equilibrium and sustainability. Can we learn to be aware of these dynamic realities and facilitate them? <laughs>